Well, good morning. I want to give you a very warm welcome, and I also want to wish you a very happy new year as well, too. Now, we've got to get used to writing 2023 now, and everything, which is going to take a little bit of time as well, too, but a very happy new year, and it is a bit of a cold one in here, but a cold one out there, sorry, but nice and warm in here. So let's enjoy the warmth of our fellowship today, and let's enjoy our time together as we we turn to God's Word. And I'm going to just read uh, just a couple of verses from Daniel, and Daniel chapter 2, and it says this, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. To you, O God, we offer thanks and praise. And so let's join in our worship together to the everlasting God, the one who is unchanging and who is our guide through all of life. This is guide me, O thy great Jehovah. And if you're able to, we'll stand as we sing this together, please. Let's come before the Lord and let's ask for not only his blessing upon the service, but also let's commit even the the rest of the year, even ahead of us, to him as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that you are the God who is from everlasting to everlasting, the one who possesses all wisdom, the one who knows us better even than we know ourselves, the one who knows all of our days. And also what this, even what this new year will also hold for each of us. Lord, you are the one who possesses all power. The one who has power to save, power to change, power to sanctify and to work in our hearts. Lord, you are the one who possesses all authority, who is above all things. The one who is able to impart your great wisdom and knowledge even through your word. And so, Lord, we do commit this year ahead of us into your hands. Lord, help us in this year ahead. Lord, be our guide as we've just sung about. Help us, Lord, even to to spend more time in your word, to give attention, Lord, above all things in our walk with you. And Lord, keep us close to you. Lord, draw us nearer to you and also nearer to one another as well as we do so. And so, Lord, we... We do pray for those even who who can't be here today just due to illness or other circumstance. Those unable to attend, maybe who have COVID or those with other illnesses or other circumstances unable to get out. 
Lord, we pray that you would continue to uphold them, that you would strengthen them by your word and by your presence. Lord, as I watch this service later as well, uh, we pray that they would be helped and encouraged by it. And Lord, we pray also for each and every head bowed here in our, our building today and others even watching online as we gather in this service, Lord, that you will speak to us once again, that you will enlarge our faith, that you will stir and challenge our hearts. And so, Lord, direct our thoughts to you. And we commit this time together into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing another hymn together, and we're just going to stay seated as we sing this. And uh, as we're saying in our opening uh, reading, I were reminded that God is the one who is from everlasting to everlasting. All things are in his hands, and the Lord is the one who is the Ancient of Days. Let's sing that wonderful hymn together, Ancient of Days. Just stay seated, please. <coughs>
But what an important reminder that that hymn gives us. That though we may not know what the future may hold and what this year will bring, we know the one who goes with us. And therefore we will not fear, for he is our God. Let me uh, bring a few announcements, and there are a few of these, so please do bear with me. Um, so with it being New Year's Day, there is, there's no evening service uh, this evening, so no evening service uh, just this week. But then after uh, today, things will all be, most of the things will be resuming again. Our midweek will be back on on Tuesday at 8 o'clock. And then as also our kids club is returning as well on Thursday at 6.30. And something else we've mentioned um, a little while ago before is about the... Well, last year we took the pop-up shop, and again, that was with the, the goal of trying to, to reach out to our community. And uh, we're doing that again uh, with the Churches Together project with the folks at Second Cumber and also with the Methodist Church as well too and uh, the folks at The Net who are organizing this. And so again, we're hoping to run that from the week beginning uh, the 8th of January. Now, we're advertising it as a, a warm space because these are challenging uh, times as well. So we're encouraging people to come in, uh, come in for a cup of tea, and we'll have a few uh, things there as well for them in the, the pop-up shop. Uh, but we're still, uh, we have some volunteers for that, but we could still do with more as well. So if you'd like to volunteer for that, please give your name to Alfie. And uh, we're collecting some volunteers for that. And that's, uh, we're looking for people really to do just a, a two-hour shift to commit to doing that. And that's just, we're going to spread that around uh, a number of people. So if you're able to sign up for one shift or two or whatever, um, but uh, it's just enable us to schedule that in as well to ensure that the shop is manned. So uh, from the 8th of January, I'll mention some more about this, God willing, next week. Um, but it's going to be operating from, I think, at 10 o'clock till 4, I think. And then it's also open on Thursday evening as well too. But again, I'll announce this next week. And please feel free to mention that to others as well too. And we'll be advertising that on our church um, Facebook page as well. Something else you see down the back, we mentioned this before, I think at uh, our Christmas Day service. We have 2023 calendars, children's calendars. Uh, which if you'd like to give them out to um, anyone even in your, your neighborhood or um, also as well, uh, maybe any grandchildren, maybe calling around for New Year's Day, well, why not take some of these to give to them as well? These are on calendars um, published by CEF, so 2023 calendars, or equally if you'd like one yourself, I'm sure it's, it's okay for you to take one of those. Uh, so those are sitting down the back and I encourage you to take those. And then also we've got a card um, It says, please uh, thank the folks at Cumber Baptist for the kind gift towards the ministry in Indonesia. It is greatly appreciated. And may the Lord continue to bless you all. And that's from Philip and uh, Rita who were here with us talking about the work of Indonesia. That was Philip and Rita Lewis. So we thank them for that. Uh, something else to announce as well, it's our, um, our nights of prayer are going to be taking place not this week, but next week. Okay, so that's advance notice of that. So not this week coming, but the, uh, the week uh, beginning Monday the 8th, our nights of prayer will be happening. Um, so we we'll mention that again, God willing, next week. But it's also on that note of prayer, it's also this week is the Baptist Mission uh, week of prayer, so don't confuse things. Our week of prayer is next week. Baptist Missions week of prayer is this week. So um, they're encouraging us to pray for the mission, make a special effort to do that this week. And so I think we'll have a little video to show you here from Mervyn Scott to encourage us to do just that. Thanks, Jim. Hi there, Mervyn Scott from Baptist Missions, inviting you to join us for our week of prayer, January the 1st to the 8th, 2023. We're hoping as many people in our churches across the island of Ireland will be praying with us during our special week of prayer. You can download our week of prayer booklet if you haven't got a physical copy on our website or on our social media pages. And every day, uh, three or four times a day, we'll be posting updates from our workers in France, Ireland, Peru and Spain to give you up-to-date praise and prayer points. So please, as many of you as possible, join with us in prayer January to the 1st to the 8th, 2023. Thank you.
prayer guides that Mervyn was talking about are just down at the back. Uh, please uh, take some of those and we'll, we'll be remembering uh, Baptist Missions and Prayer on Tuesday evening uh, as well too as part of our regular prayer time. But do each day there's little, it's broken up into little updates. And if you're on um, social media, as Mervyn was saying, uh, they have posted little videos up there. And this morning there was one from um, Philip Moore. Uh, that was this morning's little update. So there'll be several of those. So if you're on Facebook or anything, keep an eye out for that. And if you haven't as yet liked the Baptist Missions page, well, then you can do that as well to get those updates. But we'll be remembering Baptist Missions in prayer uh, in just a little while. Uh, but these, uh, as far as I'm aware, are all the announcements. Uh, I thought there was going to be an amen there. But no, uh, that's all our announcements for today. But uh, let's sing another hymn together. And then after that, we will remember the work of Baptist Missions in Prayer. And uh, we'll talk about the three prayer points to mention today. So uh, let's stand, if you're able to, as we sing, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. <laughs> Jim was testing her memory with the last verse, and I was testing my, I was testing my memory. My memory's failed already because actually I forgot to announce silver threads. You see, if I'd have written it in my CEF 2023 calendar, I wouldn't have forgot that. So it's silver threads uh, this week as well, and going by my memory, it's Fred Greenfield. Yes, well, at least I hasn't totally failed me. Fred Greenfield, and he'll be taking the silver threads on Wednesday at uh, 2.30, so do bear that in mind. Uh, we're going to pray for some of these Baptist Missions uh, prayer points, 
And um, so as I say, there was a video released this morning with an update from Philip Moore about the work in France. And um, in your little um, week of prayer booklet, you'll see it says there are over 65 million people around one per, uh, so 65 million people uh, there in France and 1% claim to be evangelical Christians. Only 1% in the whole of France. And it's, it's that, but they also as an encouragement, there's been 1,200 churches planted in France since 1980. That's really encouraging. 1,200 churches planted in France since 1980. And yet such a small number yet still who need to know the gospel. And today we're being asked to remember Philip Moore working in France and his family. And also the Livingstones in France. And then Cormac Walsh as he seeks to plant a church in Ireland. So let's pray for these folks now as we come together to pray. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks, Lord, for even this news, even in the, our, our prayer letters about how your, your church is being built in France, of how the number of people there, are, Lord, and such a, a small number here are believers, but yet since 1980, 1,200 churches have been planted. Father, we pray, Lord, that you will help those churches as they seek to minister to their communities, as they seek to, to grow and to, to reach out. And we pray uh, particularly for Philip and his family. Lord, pray for them as they seek to build those relationships. Lord, we pray for their church, that they would be able to find the, the finance even which they're seeking to buy the building in which uh, they are at the moment. And Lord, we we pray for Philip uh, as he seeks to train future uh, ministers of the gospel as well there, as he seeks to just really disciple those 20 uh, workers, Lord, that he has. Father, we pray, Lord, that they would go and minister in, in other parts, uh, even of those churches in France, as they seek opportunities for those who are training, they're training to be pastors or assistant pastors. Lord, we pray for them. And so, Lord, also we pray that you would um, raise up even more laborers, Lord, even to go into this wonderful mission field. And we pray for Philip as they even seek to explore this opportunity, even to plant another church. Lord, we give thanks that how the work there is continuing to grow. And we also pray for the living stones uh, in the road. Lord, we pray that their church will, uh, their church there will continue to. Uh, be, a, be stabilized and to grow both spiritually and numerically. Lord, help them as they also seek to reach out. We pray for Cormac Walsh, Lord, uh, ministering even in, in, in Dublin as well too. And for those uh, seeking to, to form this new church of uh, new North City Baptist, Lord, guide them. Grant them wisdom, Lord, even in the decisions that they make. Help them, Lord, and may they seek fruit for their labor as they seek to evangelize and as they seek to disciple those who they have currently uh, working with them, Lord. Lord, we pray for Cormac and Anya. Lord, we pray for the families of our Baptist missions, Lord, uh, our Baptist missions workers. Lord, watch over them, protect them, guard even their walk with the Lord. And Lord, in this year ahead, may they be assured of of you who go with them, that the one who has called them into that mission field will continue to sustain them there. And so, Lord, now as we come to your word, Lord, we pray for ourselves as we come to this. And again, Lord, speak to us through it. In Jesus' name, be glorified in us. Amen. So as we enter into this a new year, I want to just leave one verse with you. Just one verse in Romans, Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, and in verse 13, we see a prayer that Paul prayed for a group of believers who were also in need of some spiritual strengthening. And this simple prayer is an important one. It's fact, in fact, uh, when Spurgeon uh, preached in this verse, he called it one of the richest passages in the Word of God. So it's Romans chapter 15 and verse 13. A simple verse, which is a prayer, and I pray it will be our prayer even in this year ahead of us. And it says, May the God of hope 
fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Let's read that again. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen. You know, I wonder how you're feeling about the year ahead of you. Maybe the last year was a difficult year for you. And maybe that's made you even a little bit apprehensive about the year to come. You're maybe hoping this year is going to be better than the, the next. Or, or maybe with all the different things that are happening in our world today, maybe you're going into this year feeling a, maybe a little bit flat. Well, today I want to remind us about something which every believer possesses. Yet it's something we often forget about. Or maybe we don't appreciate this precious gift as we ought. It's the gift of hope. Hope. And hope is such an important thing because as believers, we are a hopeful people. We possess a great hope. And if we lack hope, we get disheartened. We get disillusioned. We can lack motivation if we haven't got hope as well. We can fail to make progress without hope. And psychologists tell us that actually hope can actually make present difficulties easier to bear. To have hope makes present difficulties easier to bear. And when preparing for today, I was reading the story of a man who was caught in rubble after a massive earthquake in the island of Haiti. And that took place in in uh, January 2010. There was a massive earthquake took place there and buildings were destroyed. Many were killed and uh, or maimed. And hope for finding future victims, almost they were about to abandon hope, it seemed. But then they discovered a man called Wismans, Wismond Exantus. From, he was found in the rubble of a hotel grocery store. Now let me tell you when they found him. It was some 11 days later after the earthquake. While they were about to abandon hope, they found Mr. Exantus. And they later interviewed him. And here's what he said. He told the reporter the first thing he wanted to do was to find a church and give thanks. Because he says he spent the time there lying in that rubble, praying, reciting psalms, and sleeping. And he summed up his experience there as he prayed, reciting those psalms. He says, I wasn't afraid because he said, I knew they were searching and they would come for me. I knew they were searching and they would come for me. Here was a man, you see, who had hope. He didn't let go of hope. And that hope sustained him for those 11 days. And he was giving thanks to God, the one who had sustained him for doing that. You see, hope is powerful. And actually, hope is vital in the Christian life. But before we proceed, it's important, I think, to get our terminology straight. Because when we talk about hope, some people have a a vague or very weak sense of hope. Um, If you look up how even the dictionary defines hope, what you'll see is sometimes the dictionary defines it in two ways. The first definition I read said is that hope is to cherish a desire that something good will happen with some expectation or success or fulfillment. So that's almost like a hope as being like a a hope. So people talking about, you know, I hope it won't rain today or something like that. But that's not the way the Bible talks about hope. When the Bible talks about hope, it talks about it in the second type of definition where it's a trust or a confidence. The Bible talks about hope as an eager expectation of something that's certain. An eager expectation of something that's certain. And the reason why it's certain is because the one who promises us this hope in the Bible is one who doesn't lie. He's one whose character is completely trustworthy and he is faithful. And he is one who is all powerful because people sometimes in our world can can make promises to us. And sometimes people can can make those promises well, very well intentioned. And something unexpected happens and they're maybe forced to break that promise. But God doesn't break his promises. He is one who is all powerful. Nothing can thwart his plan or his will. Nothing can break those promises that he's made. And so Paul wanted these believers to to know of this hope and to be assured of this hope. And actually hope is something that in the letter to uh, uh, these believers in Rome, he mentions it actually several places. And actually in Rome he's he's, he's writing to a group of believers who as yet he hasn't met them. But yet he's burdened for them. 
And you'll see in Romans chapter 1, verses 11 to 12, it talks about how he longs to see them in order that he might impart some spiritual gift to strengthen them. He wants to impart a spiritual gift to strengthen them. And also he says that we may be mutually uh, encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. And what a goal this is, isn't it? For us in the year ahead that we would mutually encourage one another. And I want you to notice how Paul encourages these believers. Because right the way through this letter, and in fact, uh, one of the key verses is Romans 1, verses 16 to 17. He encourages them with the gospel. This is how he instills this hope. He doesn't instill this hope through empty platitudes or by saying, you know, cheer up, come on, you can do it. That's not what he says. What he says is he brings them to the gospel, which is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. That's where he begins this letter. That's where he continues this letter. And that's where he finishes this letter as he draws this letter near to a close. So he explains the gospel And also there are implications, the implications of the gospel for people's lives as well too. And so as he draws this letter to a close in the penultimate chapter here, chapter 15, he shares several occasions of his prayer for them. And you actually find that in chapters 15 and 16, there's a number of places where he talks about may the God of, and he he goes on to talk about this is the prayer that he has for them. And so he tells us, He wants these believers really to have this proper mindset. This is his prayer here. He wants these believers to be hopeful. And the way he does it is he wants them to know some firm reasons for hope. And in doing so, in this verse, he tells us three things. The first he shares is the source of hope. The second thing he shares is the state of hope. And then what a hopeful, in other words, what a hopeful Christian looks like. And then also the supply of this hope. So notice in this prayer, Paul reminds us, he begins by reminding us the source of this hope. It's God is the source of this hope. Paul directs his prayer not just to God, but he says he is the God of hope. We couldn't have known that he is the God of hope unless God had first revealed that to us. God revealed himself to us. And this is something that Paul talks about earlier in this chapter. If you've still got your Bible open, have a look at verse 4 and you'll see this. Here Paul talks about uh, the scriptures and he says, Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. He wants them to know that in the scriptures we have instruction in order that we might have endurance, but also that we would have encouragement. And if we want to know encouragement, we need to spend time in the word. As Spurgeon describes the scriptures as windows of hope to us when he spoke on verse 4. And you know, the Bible describes God, you see, in a a number of ways. Uh, Here, uh, Paul talks about the God of hope, but uh, he's the God of all comfort in scripture. We meet that as well. As we look at how God reveals himself, he not only reveals himself as the God of comfort, he also says often he's the God of peace as well. And there are many even images of God as a rock, as a fortress. All these things give us encouragement to know that this is who God is. Uh, Verse 5 describes him as the God of endurance and encouragement. And now he's described as the God of hope. See, the Bible reveals what God is like. It reveals even the promises, what he promises as well. And these promises give us hope. The revelation of God's character gives us confidence. It gives us confidence as well of knowing that the God of Abraham, Moses, and uh, David, and of Israel is our God too. That gives us encouragement. The scriptures also show us the way of hope as well. Because the Bible reveals not only who God is, but it reveals of what we are like. That we are sinners. And let me remind you of some verses that Paul said in Ephesians 2 verse 12. He says, at one time we were separated from Christ, having no hope. And without God in the world. See, without God, we have no hope. But God offers us hope because God shows us in the scriptures of his rescue plan for humanity. He promised to send a deliverer. One who's able to save us from our sin. One who did that through the giving of his life. When he bore our guilt, our sin, our shame upon himself. 
And through faith in him, we as sinners can be reconciled to God. He offers us hope. He shows us how we can find this wonderful hope through Christ. And look again at the rest of this chapter, verses 8 to 12. Christ came not to be served, but he came to be a a servant to Israel in order to show God's truthfulness, his faithfulness. He sent Christ even his promises to fulfill those promises. And also in verse 9 of this same chapter, he shows us uh, the Lord didn't just come for the Jews, for Israel only. No, he came for the Gentiles as well too, that we might glorify God and praise him for his mercy. And then in verses 9 to 12, just leading up to this verse, we see the encouragement that Scripture gives because here uh, Paul quotes from various places in the Bible, from the law, from a book of history, and then from the Psalms, and then from the prophets. Four quotations which talk about Christ who will come. In other words, he's talked about hope before, how the Scriptures give us hope, and then he's showing us how this hope was realized through Christ how he fulfilled these very things. In verse 11, uh, sorry, verse 12, he says, the root of Jesse uh, will come. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. Jesus, the Messiah, the, the root of Jesse, he is the one who will come. He is the one in who we find this hope. So see how we know this hope. He's revealed it in the scriptures. He's made this hope available to us through Christ. So God is our source of hope. Everything starts with him. And so if we want to have true and lasting hope in this world, we have to start with him. Because to find hope in any other foundation, that will fail. If we find it in any other foundation, all other things will fail. But our God will not. And you know, sometimes people look for hope in all the wrong places. We don't find hope in money or investments. Uh, what was the, the ad used to say? Stocks can go down as well as up. Uh, but we find we, we can't find hope in possessions either. Uh, things that break down or deteriorate over time. These things can't bring lasting hope. We can't find hope in our own uh, strength or health because sometimes that too can fail us. We can't find hope in government. In the past year, if anything, has surely taught us that with having three prime ministers in such a, a short space of time. We can't find lasting hope in career either because in such a volatile economy, jobs can be so easily lost. Even people, even our friends can sometimes even fail us as well. We need to trust one who never fails, one who never disappoints, one who always keeps his word and can be relied upon. And so there's no accident that the the Bible often says, hope in the Lord. You find that in the Psalms where it talks about, oh, Israel, hope in the Lord. There are many passages which talk about that. And the reason why we need to be reminded of that is sometimes we are tempted to trust in in false sources of hope. Maybe we uh, unwittingly maybe do that. If we try to find lasting peace and joy and and something that can't satisfy here in this world we are going to be disappointed but we need to find our hope and place our hope completely in God alone consider the hope that we have in Christ had Jesus not come then we'd still be in despair about our sins without Christ we wouldn't be able to find peace with God because Jesus came to be that atonement for our sin We have this hope because of what Jesus has done for us. And through faith in him, we are reconciled with God. Had Jesus not rose again also, then we'd have no hope in the face of death. But he did rise again. He defeated death. And we know that if we have that faith in Christ Jesus, one day we too will defeat that as well. So how do we have this hope? Well, Paul tells us, look back to our verse again. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. This is our part. So if God's part is this source of hope and imparting this hope, our part is by believing. This hope comes through faith in God, through trusting the one who God has sent and believing that we are sinners and realizing that Jesus paid the price for our sin and he became our savior to give of his life for us and he rose again to give us this blessed hope. We have this hope by believing. We believe in God. We believe in his character. We believe in his promises. We believe in God's plan of redemption. We believe in his purposes. 
Um, the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 11 verse 6, Without faith it's impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. He is the one in who we find this hope. It all starts with him. A hope that endures in the face of death. A hope that endures amidst the darkest days and the days of trial. A hope that gives assurance. And as the writer of Hebrews thought of that hope, well, Hebrews 6 verses 18 to 19, it describes it as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. That is the hope that we have. And why do we have that hope? Because he says it's impossible for God to lie. Those who find refuge in him have a strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. But Paul doesn't just tell us about the source of hope here in this verse, because he wants us to know, here's what, what does this hope look like, like in the life of the believer? What is it about the state of our hope? Well, Paul prays that they would have joy and peace in believing. Here's what Paul wanted the lives of believers to be marked by, joy. As you know, joy in the Christian life is something actually that Paul talked often about. It's actually something of a theme for Paul. And across Paul's writings, when you actually look at it, Paul actually talks about joy more times than any other New Testament writer. He talks about joy more times than any other New Testament writer. Some 21 times in his writing, John only talks about joy about nine times. But Paul, some 21 times, he speaks about it. It's something also that Paul links with faith. As Christians, we should have some measure of joy as well as peace, which we'll talk about shortly. Because these things are fruit of the Spirit. They are within us. They're given to us as a gift of the Spirit. And this fruit grows in our life. It should continue to grow. See, the Christian life wasn't meant to be a joyless life. As Jesus taught his disciples in the upper room, when he was about to, to leave them, he taught them many things. He was preparing them for what they were going to face. And they were going to face persecution and suffering. They weren't going to face easy days. But Jesus told them of the Spirit who would come to them. But also he says uh, to love and keep his commandments. And then he said these words in John 15 verse 11. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you. He wanted them to be joyful. I've spoken you these things. I've taught you these things that you would have joy. And that your joy may be full. Not just that they'd be you know, a little bit happy and content for a while. But that their joy may be full. He said to them, he said, they would have sorrow now, but when they see him, they'd rejoice and have joy. And no one would be able to take that joy from them. Imagine that, a joy that no one can take from you. See, the joy that we have in Christ is a lasting joy. Paul isn't just saying to these believers, try and smile more. That's not what he's saying. You know, that was, that was one of the times it was... I was looking up for, a, for another message uh, about, you know, uh, things to, to try and make yourself happier. And it said, try and smile more, you know. And, and that was one of the suggestions that psychologists give us, you know, try and put on a smile. That's not what Paul's saying. Paul's talking about a deeper joy, not just a surface level thing. Because we can sometimes put on a, a mask for people, can't we? You know, when people say, how are you doing? You go, okay, fine. When inside you're thinking... Really, things aren't good at the moment. But the joy here that Paul's talking about is not a surface level thing. This is something deeper. This is a deeper joy because it's actually not based on our circumstances. If we find our joy just in things like uh, possessions or uh, relationships and things like that, well, you know, those things, sometimes those things don't last. They can't satisfy us completely. But the joy we have in Christ can because it's not dependent on our circumstances. It's a deeper joy. It's a much deeper joy. A joy that even though we may be, even though we may mourn, even as well, we can find comfort in the one who has defeated death. There's a joy in knowing that, even in the face of death. That there is hope. There is a blessed hope. A living hope. That's something that robs even death of its sting. There's also a joy in knowing sins forgiven. A joy in knowing sins forgiven and remembering of God's love for those who are his. And that doesn't change. You know, what an encouragement that is in a time maybe when you've failed, when you've let the Lord down, to know that God's love is steadfast. 
That's such a comfort, isn't it? It's not something to be joyful about. Hear the deeper joy, see this, that no matter what disappointments even we may face in life, we know we have a God who is able to bring something good even out of a time of suffering. He's able to draw us closer to him even during those times. A joy that enables us to pray like the psalmist prayed. In Psalm 73 verse 26 it says, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Even though the psalmist's um, his flesh, his, his body may fail, his, his heart, though he may sometimes feel, uh, you think where things maybe aren't going well in the psalmist's life, but he's able to say, God's the strength of my heart. He's my portion in life forever. See that deeper joy here? God can use even difficult circumstances, not only for his glory, but also for our greater good. There's a song by a woman called Laura Story who herself faced a great tragedy. And the reason why this was actually brought to my mind is it's uh, one, of the, one of the books I actually got my mum for Christmas. Um, it was the, uh, Laura Story's life story. And um, she'd gone through quite a difficult circumstance. Her husband, Martin, had been diagnosed with a brain tumour after just two years of marriage. They'd only just recently been married and he was diagnosed with this brain tumour. And little did she think, she said, as they vowed those words in sickness and health, you know, that they would be tested so soon. And so after uttering, you know, these, uh, only a couple of years after uttering those words, their lives would change forever. There was no cure to restore his short-term memory loss, even that he had, or his eyesight as it was impacted. And for her, she said, it felt like her dreams were shattered. But yet, she says, God gave her hope. And God actually used that experience in her life to draw her closer. Laura's story since became a a singer-songwriter. And she wrote a, a beautiful song called Blessings. And let me read you some words from that. She says, We pray for blessings, we pray for peace, comfort for family, protection while we sleep. We pray for healing, for prosperity. We pray for your mighty hand to ease our suffering. And all the while you hear our each spoken need. Yet love is way too much to give us lesser things. Because what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? And what if trials in this life are your mercies in disguise? It's a beautiful song, that. And I encourage you even to listen to that if you can find that even online as well too. What if trials of this life are God's mercies in disguise. God sometimes uses the difficult times in order to make us see his light even more. See, our God is able to grant us a deeper joy because he doesn't change. Our joy isn't dependent on circumstances. It's dependent on God's character, God's purposes, and the joy of the Lord is our strength. See, the more happy we are in God, the more we know of that joy. The closer we draw to him, the more we will find that deeper joy. But also he speaks of peace. Peace. When the Bible speaks about peace, it speaks about it in two different senses. There's peace with God. A peace which comes about when we're reconciled with God through faith in Christ. But there's not only peace with God, but there's also a peace which God gives and imparts to us as well. That fruit of the Spirit. And again, the joy and uh, and peace uh, Paul talks about. It's, a, it's something that comes through being in a proper relationship with God. Do you know, one of the most famous verses in peace, if I was to ask you right now, think of a verse in peace where the Bible talks about it. I think you'll probably be thinking about one in Philippians chapter 4. A peace that passes understanding. Peace that passes understanding. That's the kind of peace that God can give. A peace that can endure amidst a cancer diagnosis. A peace that can endure amidst the pandemic. Because God, it says in those verses, is able to guard our hearts and minds in Christ. See, it's linked to our relationship with the Lord. That peace and joy. That's how we find that. It says, in everything. We aren't to be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Think about that. Paul links, do not be anxious. So instead of being anxious, he says, take everything to the Lord in prayer. Even with thanksgiving. 
It's sometimes hard to be thankful during the difficult times, but when we do be thankful, it reminds us of how God has blessed us. See, this peace comes about through the hope we find in God's word. This peace comes about through God's unchanging, steadfast love. And this, the the scriptures give us this peace because it reminds us of God's purposes in our lives. It reminds us of this peace because it reminds us not only of God's character, but even of the glorious destiny of every believer. Our future is assured in Christ. Our future is assured in him. If we are in Christ Jesus, we know we have a glorious future. That glorious future is we one day we will be with him in glory. And that awaits all believers. And I want you to notice the extent of this joy and peace. Notice carefully what it says. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. He wants us to know a, a complete joy and peace in believing. A fullness to joy. In other words, a joy of joys, joy to the highest degree. It's a greater because this, of this hope that God gives us is a lasting one. The joy that he's going to get and he gives to us is a lasting joy. Few things in this world, when we think about it, are lasting. Our bodies, over time, begin to, to break down. We have aches and pains and things like that. And our homes, also in need of repair. But yet... God gives us something that's lasting. You know, maybe you've already received some Christmas presents that are maybe already beginning to wear out a little bit. Maybe the sweets that give you pleasure uh, for Christmas Day or Boxing Day maybe are long gone. Maybe the flowers even you received are beginning to fade. But this hope that we have, this joy and peace, is something that is forever. It's forever lasting. You know, the hope that we believers have of us believers isn't a static thing. It's a hope that grows. And so as we grow in God's grace, as we draw closer to God, this hope should increase in its depth and intensity. I wonder if we're not experiencing this hope, this joy, and this peace as we ought to. Could it be because we've maybe lost contact with the God who supplies it? Could it be maybe that our relationship with him is not as it should be? Maybe we have been putting our trust in false sources of hope. Maybe not even realizing it. Maybe we have been neglecting our quiet times or we have been just doing them out of routine. We need to get in touch with the God who can satisfy and does satisfy. We need to enlarge our view of God. And and what a good prayer for 2023 that God would even enlarge our vision, would deepen our hope would actually enable us to move forward in this year having a fresh vision of him. You know, C.S. Lewis described uh, people as half-hearted creatures because he says we fool about with other things in this world uh, that the world has to offer, things that are fleeting. But what, you know, when instead infinite joys offered to us, infinite joys offered to us, and yet we're, we're content with things that are lesser. He says we're like an ignorant child at times who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum Because we can't imagine what a holiday by the sea would be like. A child that's entertained by the small things instead of the greater things. We are meant to be far we are we are far too easily pleased by false sources sometimes of joy and hope, instead of trusting in the one who truly gives us us. But notice here you see, we need to have this to be in touch with God. To know and be assured of this hope in our life, to draw closer to Him. He wants our lives to be guaranteed to be sorry, characterized by joy and peace. But he tells us where this leads to. Lastly, and very briefly, we see this supply of hope. Paul prays this prayer, you see, that believers would abound in hope. Our God is one, you see, who isn't a, a, he's not miserly. He's a great, gracious giver. He prays that we'd abound in this hope. Not just have a little bit of hope, but have a hope that's almost overflowing in our life. And who supplies it? It's by the power of the Holy Spirit. God's graciously given his Spirit to us as a gift. When the Bible speaks about the believer's heavenly home and our longing for that home, it reminds us that while we are in our uh, earthly body, we're away from that heavenly hope. But God has given us his Spirit within us as a, a guarantee, a down payment. Because it reminds us that one day we're going to receive the fullness of that salvation. We have the Spirit as but a foretaste. That's God's guarantee. One day we're going to have that joy and all his fullness. And we have a foretaste of that now. 
But one day our joy is going to be complete because our faith is going to be sight. Our sanctification on that day will be complete. No longer trouble with indwelling sin. On that day, even our bodies will have a, a glorious resurrection body. We'll have a heavenly home and we'll experience that fullness of joy for eternity. What a glorious hope we have. Can you see this hope is nothing that, this hope is, is sorry, one that nothing in this world can destroy this hope. Nothing in this world can destroy it. Nothing in this world can take away this hope from us. Because this hope is guaranteed in Christ Jesus. That can't be robbed. It can't be taken away from us. Possessions can be easily taken away, can't they? Finances can be easily taken away. But if you have this hope in Christ, that's a lasting one. And no matter what happens in the year ahead... That's a hope that no one can take away from us. And what did Paul write in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9? No eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, but God has prepared for those who know and love him. What wonderful things God has planned for his people. And this hope is ours through the power of the Holy Spirit. As we read God's word, even in this year ahead, may our hope be inflamed even by that. As we see of the one who promised these things, as we read of those promises and let them take hold in our lives, and let us be moving forward in this year, not with a hesitancy, but with a trust, a confidence. And as we close, I wonder, how's your hope today? What about our measure of joy and peace? Do you know, the new year is a great time for taking stock of things, isn't it? To make a fresh start. And maybe that's something we need to make in our lives. What about our prayer life? What about our quiet times? What about our church life? Maybe we've, have we maybe distanced ourselves from, from what God has, has given us to be a, a means of encouragement? We're meant to even be a mutual encouragement to one another. The church, the place where we study God's word together, the place where we pray for one another, the place where we seek to build up one another, the place where we seek to serve one another. And so don't give up. Hope in God. And let us pray that the God of hope would fill us with joy and peace and believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit we can abound in hope. Let's pray together and then after that we'll, we'll sing before we come around the table. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks, Lord, for the hope that we have in you. That it is a hope that can't be robbed or taken away from us. That it's a precious possession that we have. That it, it's something which uh, also comes about through the fruit in our life, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And Father, that fruit's still growing within us. Maybe the fruit of joy, the fruit of peace is still maybe small in our life. Lord, we need that to grow in our hearts this year. Lord, help us as we do that from your word. Help us, Lord, as we read the scriptures, Lord, even in the year ahead, as we study them together. Help us, Lord, to not only draw near to you, but to draw near to one another, to serve together, to not distance ourselves from, from something that you have given us, to be a means of encouragement to us. Help us, Lord, as we commit ourselves afresh even to you in this year ahead to be reminded of the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. And so help us to be reminded of that as we meet around the table just now. In Jesus' name, amen. Just to stay seated as we sing this uh, hymn, there is a hope that burns within my heart and then we'll meet around the table.
Please turn your Bibles to just one verse in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. And Peter writes, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know, as we gather at the beginning of this another year, there is a sense also in which we look back as well as forward. You know, every year leading up to this moment of New Year's Day, always on TV you'll see those programs of, you know, a look back at the events or in the papers, you'll see the same thing. Some of the key events that have taken place in the years that have gone, the year that's gone past. And then there is that sense, not just of looking back, but also of looking forward as people you know, wonder what will the new year bring. But as we gather around this table, there is a sense in which we also look back, but also look forward as well. As we gather around the table, we look back in the sense that we remember and give thanks for Christ's atoning death, as these emblems remind us of that. But there is a sense in which we look forward too, because we know that there is a, a risen Savior and we know that in that passage I read from Corinthians, that whenever we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. One day that risen Savior is coming again for us. So at present, we live between the two comings of Christ. And the first, we, we look to the manger, the cross, and the empty tomb, where our salvation was purchased for us through the blood of Christ. But we also look forward to the day when Christ comes again. We look back and we look forward. And Peter reminds us in this verse that we've just read how we are to live until that day. We're to prepare our minds for action. The literal meaning of this, or if if you're reading from the authorized, it, it talks about girding up the loins, girding up the loins of your mind. When someone was preparing to to take action, they gathered their their robes, you see. It's because they didn't want anything that would hinder them in their movement. So it means really to gather the the loose ends of our thinking, to gather our thoughts. We're to be sober-minded or self-controlled, rejecting anything that would hinder us in this world, and instead focusing on the, the future grace that awaits us. This is what Peter's urging here. We're to be hopeful. We spoke about that this morning. To set our hope fully on the grace that will be brought to us when Christ is revealed again at his second coming. You know, this table is a reminder of the grace of God. It shows us the grace that he's shown us in Christ. But we also receive sustaining grace daily from God, don't we, each day? But it's a reminder that there is more to come. And this table is a continuing reminder of that hope. See, there's a reason why Jesus gave his disciples this means of remembrance. Because it was to be repeated. Because we are so prone to forget at times, aren't we? We look back and we're reminded on the means of our salvation around this table. But we also look forward. Because there'll be a day when we will uh, no longer, we'll need to remember the Lord in this way. Because on that day he returns. We will have him, we will be with him in all its fullness then we will know a fullness and joy. Then we will know complete peace. Then that hope will be realized. We have hope now, but one day we will see that glorious hope. And one day we will receive all joy of joys when we'll have unbroken fellowship with the Lord. And so until that day, we as Christians should never be a hopeless people because we have a blessed hope a sure and certain hope, a living hope. And so let's respond by setting our hope fully in him and responding with thanksgiving. And let us do that even now as we begin to give thanks for these emblems. We're reminded in that passage that when the Lord Jesus had given thanks, he had broke the bread and he said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when Jesus had taken the cup, he said to them, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's give thanks. Father, we do thank you indeed for the great hope that we have of one day being with you forever in glory. And that is only possible, Lord, because of what your Son, our Saviour, did for us at Calvary when he laid down his life that we might be redeemed. He, he took upon himself your wrath and punishment for my sins, for the sins of the world. And Lord, just as we take of this bread now, which reminds us of that body so freely given, accept of our thanks again, in Jesus' name. Our Heavenly Father, as we've been thinking in recent weeks of the child in the manger becoming the saviour of the world, we thank you this morning as we look upon the table, we're reminded of that great sacrifice that came. And we'd ask you, dear Father, that you would accept of our thanks for this wine which reminds us of that shed blood, that precious blood shed for each one of us. And we thank you from the bottom of our hearts in our Saviour's name. Amen.
Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you that you are the God of hope. And Father, we give thanks, Lord, that you are worthy of our praise, that you never fail us. And Father, we give thanks for the lasting joy and the peace you can give us, one which circumstances cannot rob us of, a hope that endures through even amidst the darkest of days. Father, as this table has reminded us as we look back and remember of what Jesus has done for us and our means of salvation. Father, we also look forward to that day when he comes and our, we set our hope fully on the grace that will, will be realized even when he returns as well for us. Father, we want to thank you. And we do seek your help, Lord, even for the rest of the day. Lord, bless us even as we, as we spend time with, with family on this New Year's Day and do pray even for the, the service that will be taking place in, the, um, in Mount Alexander even later on this afternoon. And Father, even as we spend time with our families later, Lord, we do pray, Lord, that, that we will be able to glorify you even in our conversation. Lord, we do pray for our families even who we're so burdened about as well too. Lord, just use our lives to be a means even of speaking to them as well. Father, we ask, Lord, that you will bless us and in this year ahead, help us to grow, Lord, spiritually. Help us, Lord, to grow even as a church as well. And Father, help us, Lord, to live for you, for your glory, and in Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.